So the Department of Tourism partnered with the Salomar International, one of the world's leading sustainable tourism consulting firms, and George Washington University in 2016 to develop a five-year national tourism plan to cover 2018 to 2023. This project was initiated to ensure that tourism growth in the Cayman Islands takes full account of its current and future economic, social, and environmental impacts, as well as addresses the needs of our visitors, the industry, and host communities. The project team worked alongside stakeholders, some of whom are with us today, to establish a shared strategic direction and strategic goals, which will impact the future sustainability and competitiveness of the Cayman Islands as a tourism destination. Rosa Harris, Director of Tourism, and her senior team have worked diligently to guide this plan through the consultative process and future implementation stage. She's a strong advocate and a respected leader among her tourism counterparts in the region and has worked tirelessly along with tourism stakeholders to achieve record-setting air and cruise arrival figures which have injected hundreds of millions of dollars into the Cayman economy. Rosa and her team continue their quest to differentiate the Cayman Islands from the rest of the competition through innovative promotional image campaigns on social media and across traditional media. She possesses more than 15 years experience in the tourism industry and is a dedicated professional who is passionate about ensuring that Cayman's tourism industry remains sustainable for many years to come. Please welcome Rosa, who will set the tone for our panel discussion on the sustainability of Cayman's tourism industry. Following Rosa's presentation, the Honorable Moses Kukernel, Acting Premier and the Minister for District Administration, Tourism and Transport will join her on stage for the panel discussion. If you see anything that sparks your interest in a question, please write it down. I'll be around to collect them. Please welcome Rosa. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll have coffee later, but you got to stay with me for the next maybe half hour and then for a little bit of a chat. It's a pleasure to be here and to have accepted the Chamber of Commerce invitation. Just to give you an overview of the state of the tourism industry. Now, I know Will gave um, a synopsis of our last year and our work on the National Tourism Plan. We're definitely fine-tuning it, and I have some updates on that. Uh, but we're going to give you a synopsis of uh, 2018 and um, just share some of our thought behind building on the Cayman Islands brand. So I believe, yes, there we go. Um, let's set the tourism tone for the next hour. So I'll start with a little video from the UK. It's the fleeting moments of beauty that define the perfect escape. The salt on your skin and the heavenly heat. The soothing caress of sand under feet. To feel the breeze to drink the air. It's the smell of the ocean in your hair. The gentle calm of the lapping tide. It's all these things and more aside. Shared in the moment, yet cherished forever. Find your perfect escape in the Cayman Islands. Don't we have a lot to be proud of as a destination? That's just one example of the UK's work. So for those that follow us on Facebook, you know about another campaign that we'll talk about a little bit later, but this is one of the current campaigns running in Europe. So for today, for the State of the Industry Address, what we have planned is just a quick overview of DOT's mandate. A lot, of, a lot of people have different opinions about what DOT should be doing. We'll let you know what our focus areas are and what we've been directed to do on behalf of tourism. We'll give you a little bit of an update on tourism performance. We're not shy about sharing our performance either. 
And then we'll talk about our national tourism plan and how we get beyond the beach, beyond focusing on sand, sea, and sun, and talk about how we bring benefit to the people of the Cayman Islands through tourism. And then we'll share a little bit about our dream and Cayman campaign that we're so proud of. So our strategic overview as a Department of Tourism, our vision statement as a department is to responsibly lead the tourism industry and position the Cayman Islands as the warm weather destination of choice. As you know, warm weather spans past the Caribbean. There are many other options for warm weather destinations globally. So we're not just competing on a Caribbean platform. We're competing with the world. Um, going back to the UK example with the video, they compete against the Indian Ocean based on the demographics and, and where, our, um, where our office and our, our activities located in, in Europe. There are many other options, not just the Caribbean for warm weather destinations. Our mission is to attract and retain visitation to the Cayman Islands by developing and implementing sustainable policies and initiatives in collaboration with all our stakeholders to benefit, for the benefit of our people. Now, the government doesn't own the product. We may manage some sites. We have Pedro, we have the Botanic Park, we have the Turtle Farm, but the meat of the product is in the private sector and we can't do our jobs without collaboration talking with everyone, understanding what they're seeing in the marketplace, and understanding how we as a Department of Tourism can support the tourism industry. Here are just some of our macro priorities. Um, we are transitioning our brand globally. So traditionally, we have had different campaigns from different source markets at various times of the year. With the Dream in Cayman campaign, we would like that to be the global face of the Cayman Islands. And any further campaign being a global face, uh, depending on the market that you're in, you could see varied representations of the Cayman Islands brand. We want deeper partnerships, and here we are at the Chamber Forum, just another example of being very eager to share the tourism message, at least what we're doing at the Department of Tourism and what we know our, our partners to be participating in. Will attended our global meeting in April. Uh, we have a global meeting every year where we bring everyone in and we talk about what is going on and how it's impacting our business. Lots of discussion now because a portion of the Caribbean is offline and we're preparing for another shift in what the Caribbean might offer in the next 24 months. Our national tourism plan implementation is a priority and we like to say aviation is our oxygen, airlift is our oxygen and I must say here that it did not originate with me, it originated with a stakeholder and I just took it on fully because I truly believe that when you have access, you make it easy for people to travel, they will consider an easier way of travel than, than it being connecting, connecting, connecting. So we like to foster relations that will provide us with more direct lift into Cayman. Business intelligence, for any of you who have visited our Cayman.ky or CaymanIslands.ky um, or our new visit CaymanIslands.com, we would, you would see that we publish our statistics monthly. And you, you can also manipulate the data. You can slice it for the years that you're interested in to see what type of historical trends they are. And we also publish reports. So we do a monthly report, a biannual, a nine month snapshot, um, and an annual report. So there's lots of information that we collect. We have an excellent research team that's, that puts this information together. And we also work very well with our partners to bring any information on specific things in the marketplace. So a lot of talk has um, gone on about wellness. What is wellness? What is self-care? How does that fit within destinations? So if there's a topic that's trending, we try to be the facilitator of business solutions and find information for our partners. Europe and China um, are a priority because Europe has been the one region that has been very tumultuous in the last 36 months, maybe a little bit longer, but it has taken some work to try to stabilize through our partnerships with British Airways, tour operators, and just 
in general being able to stimulate the market. And I'll share with you specifics later on what we're doing and some of the focus areas. And this is, and sorry, China. Uh, we have done a few missions to China for a long-term strategy. So I'll just share a little bit later about how China is looked at in the short term and where we're going and how we view China as an overall uh, source market for the Cayman Islands. This is all underpinned by governance and compliance. Um, everything that we do has to fall within our government structure. So that's an overview of some of our macro priorities. So how are we doing? What did 2018 look like? And I just want to give an overview here of the economic impact. So our research team um, collates exit surveys and we have a sample size target in order to get a good view as to what our visitor is spending, how much they're spending and what activities they're participating in while they're on vacation. Our spend grew by 12.5% based on um, our research, and it's 880.1 million for 2018. Now, I'll talk to you a little bit more about how we get a clearer picture of the tourism contribution, but of course, th these are estimations based on, on our survey activity. The average spend is $236. $236 per person per night, and for cruise, it's $115 per person, as that's a daily visit. Tourism tax collected grew by $8 million. It was a significant jump in collections of the 13% that's collected for the accommodations category and $10 per day uh, in the timeshare category. That accounted for $33.6 million in overall revenue received for tourism tax. So overall, we're very happy about 2018. In terms of traffic, so you'll see that the US market is our largest market, 385 travelers, which grew by 13% in 2018. Canada making a very nice comeback. So what Europe is going through now, Canada went through um, up to this point for the last five years. And we see and we know from our partners that when their dollar does not perform well, they don't travel. And that has stabilized and we've seen Canadians return to the Cayman Islands. The airlines as well, WestJet and Air Canada, have also committed more air capacity into the destination. So that's also a really great indicator for that particular source market. And Latin America is an investment for us, so we have agency representation for this region, and it represents 2% of our visitation, but it's 2% more than we had before. That's how we like to look at it. That's 2018. I'd like to focus on 2019 a little bit. We'll start with a chart of the Caribbean. If you look at this chart, you'll see that there's a number of countries in red. If I'm right, Puerto Rico, Anguilla, BVI, and USVI. Now, when you look at the hurricane impact and the growth, and I'm just going to go from my memory here, what you'll see jump off the page is the Bahamas, and this is year to date. I want to say it's up to April. 21% growth in the Bahamas, 17% in Curacao, 13% in Jamaica, and the Cayman Islands is ranked fourth at 11%. So we're doing very well. When you pull out, and you'll notice that Turks and Caicos is not there. They are not reporting on their numbers, but they are a very direct competitor for us based on their product and their price point. Uh, but we don't have data for Turks and Caicos. Anguilla is also a part of this set, as well as St. Martin, that's hurricane impacted. If you pull that out, this is a competitive set right now. These are the countries that are open for business. Um, when we ask ourselves, well, why is Curacao doing really well? They have 45 new flights out of Chicago. They have significant lift into their destination that's new. Their main source markets, though, are the Netherlands and Latin America. Uh, for Belize, Belize also has a tremendous amount of new lift uh, into their destination. And 
up to this point, they saw double-digit growth. This has somewhat smoothed out for Belize. Uh, Jamaica has 2,500 rooms under construction. They're at 35,000 rooms total right now, and their goal for the next three years is to get to 50,000. So there are some destinations that you have to put into context. Well, are they a direct competitor, or should we just look at that destination as maybe our visitors will consider them within that three-year cycle of travel? So this is just to put into context some of the some of the growth that's seen in the region, and also to tell the story that Cayman's growth is just as good as some of the very large countries like Jamaica, uh, Curacao, and also Bahamas. So where are we now? And I get the pleasure of making this announcement. Uh, I'd like to thank the minister for giving me that privilege. Our main numbers are in, and we typically report this the last Friday of the month for the previous month, so you're in for a treat. I'm not sure if we've given this information widely, but we welcomed 40,591 visitors in the month of May. This is the first time... This is the first time we've exceeded 40,000 passengers in the month of May ever. We've had six consecutive months of exceeding that threshold. We're very, very happy. The, the growth mainly um, from the North American region, so Canada and the United States did extremely well. And I would say that at DOT, we're all nervous about these numbers because when you soar, there's only one way you can go. So we, we just want to caveat that, that we're not saying that we will keep this momentum, but we'll ride the wave while we have it, okay? Some of the wins with this 13% um, percent overall growth, though, if I was to pull it out just to expand on the why. Why are we doing so well? So from the Denver area, and as you know, Cayman Airways launched that service in March, there were 500 more passengers in the month of May um, from the Denver area. In the Southwest area, we had 600 more passengers, namely out of the Houston and Dallas um, cities. Overall, we believe that aviation stimulates travel. So what have happened in those other areas? Southwest started service out of Houston. American had a deeper investment in Dallas, adding more frequency. Obviously, Cayman Airways with Denver. And just last weekend, we welcomed our first flight out of Baltimore on Southwest. So we expect to see movement um, in the Baltimore uh, local area and potentially um, feeder cities coming through Baltimore. I'm being given a time check, so I'm going to smooth over this to say that some of this information will be available on our website. But I gave a synopsis on um, the 40,000. Down the middle column are the main countries, USA, Canada, UK, Trinidad, and Jamaica, and that may be a CARIFTA effect as well with the Jamaica and Trinidad numbers and then just highlighting some of the main demographic marketing areas for the United States. So, what does our capacity look like? Right now we're at 6,888 rooms. That's our total capacity. We have it broken out on the, that would be your left-hand side in the green block for beds and also bed places, so sleeping capacity. And it shows the growth as well. I want to focus particularly on the middle, upper, right-hand um, block under guest house. That's where Airbnb rests, predominantly smaller properties. And we see that we have 351 licensed listings on Airbnb. Uh, but it is an area over the years that has seen significant growth. We've welcomed I would say one major Greenfield Hotel being the Sea Fire, where we are today. We've seen a renovation of Treasure Island into Margaritaville. We've welcomed Locale. That's the hotel category, but the majority of the additional capacity has come from smaller properties, creating entrepreneurship, and bringing tourism on a grassroots level. And I think that's a very positive thing. 
Also, it helps with how we develop. So linking back to congestion topics that were discussed earlier, if I can live in my community, if I can offer a service in my community, then I don't have to travel to another district to conduct business, thereby stimulating a new community of commerce. And we believe Airbnb will be able to do that. Global aviation. This just paints the picture of the commitment and the attractiveness of the destination. In 2015, we had 787,000 air seats into the destination. This is a report that's based on Q1. This has not been updated, but it will be updated for a half year. So for 2019, the commitment was 920,000 seats to the destination. That's a significant growth over five years. And this is why we say airlift is so important. When we get more commitment, when we get more access, when there's more options and availability to travelers, then it makes it an easier proposition to say, oh, there's service from nearby us, we'll take the direct from our neighboring city. And I just wanna show this graph, the top row with American Airlines leading the seat capacity. They have the largest offering amongst all the airlines, followed by Cayman Airways. So talking about market expansion, just a little bit, we'll start with the United States. This is our primary source market. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of economists in the room that will say you can't put all of your eggs in one basket, and we believe the same thing. Diversification will be very important for sustainable tourism, but it is still a very large market. So if we look at where our visitors are coming from, uh, they're coming from New York, they're coming from South Florida, they're also coming from, or Florida, they're coming from Texas. You see some pockets in there that are darkened, but we have concentration of visitation. If you look at that in a heat map, then this gives you an idea of the clusters, the density of visitation from the United States. Half of that graph is well populated in some way, the other half is not. That shows opportunity for us. How can we develop tourism further? Where else can we go? As you know, we welcomed Denver as a destination. There should be a question mark after that, what's next? Because there's a lot more business to be won out of our primary source market. I'll just leave you to think about that. So, Europe and Canada. Uh, these are our secondary markets. Canada representing a little bit more of the pie recently. Europe being a smaller um, portion, Canada is at 7%, Euro Europe is at 5% of our volume. Um, just to talk about Europe a little bit, UK and Ireland are the main markets within the Euro European region. We are making a move to do more work in Germany. Our team has visited Germany, met with tour operators, met with airlines, been able to transport the Cayman Islands brand, and we're very close to electing for a contract with a tour operator to sell the Cayman Islands. We also have a new leader, Mr. Adrian White, who started on June 1st. Uh, Adrian's visited the destination already. He left on Friday, had a full overview of uh, all three islands and met with partners as well as government. Uh, we have a lot of expectations out of Europe, so Adrian's in for quite the feat of turning our European business upside down. LATAM. The three countries that are included in our Latin America strategy are Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. Again, I mentioned it's about 2% of our um, volume, but still very important. They have quite different personalities. So Brazilians like luxury. They're divers. Argentines like food and nightlife, and they like three, four-star properties. They're very distinct personalities. Mexico is new for us, so that's a new addition to the Latin American source market. Uh, but we know that they travel at times of the year that help us with flattening of seasonality. So there's definitely a drop-off point for volume into the destination in September, October, and November. 
those are areas that we focus on to bring in persons that aren't traveling from North America during those times. So looking further afield, and by design, Asia. Just to talk about China a little bit. Last year, we attended the international luxury travel market in Shanghai. And what we very much learned was that Cayman Islands is top of mind, but from a business perspective, company registration, that type of thing, financial services. But there was this excitement around, oh, I can travel there. Oh, there are real estate opportunities in the Cayman Islands. So we found ourselves educating, showing what the destination had to offer. Stingray City uh, and the Sister Islands were quite the hit in terms of using video as a way to convey what the destination experience was like. There are a few steps to being able to do business in China from a tourism standpoint. We have to attain approved destination status with the Chinese government, and then we also have to formulate the how. So what is the most efficient way based on the resources that we do have and the partnerships that we have in place to be able to penetrate this market? There's also a back end to it. The back end is building the capacity in the destination. Do we have the language? Do we have the cultural sensitivity? Do we have the signage? Do we have all of the amenities that an Asian market traveler would expect for a hotel? And also, do we have the brands? So we have the Mandarin that's been recently announced, but when you visit Asia, there are many other different types of hotel product. There's the Shangri-La, there's the Langhams of the world, there's the Peninsulas. You find that they go beyond five star. They're in the six star category. And the question is, okay, where and the how? And is this what we want? Is, is this the how? So these are some of the questions that we're having internally about the Chinese market. Beyond the beach. Here's the distribution of capacity across the Cayman Islands, and it's by electoral district. And what you'll find is that Seven Mile Beach, Georgetown, is a very mature corridor for tourism. So Georgetown and West Bay have significant capacity as it relates to tourism accommodations. There's a lot more opportunity for the sister islands and for the eastern districts. And I show this graph because my next kind of phase of discussion goes back to the Airbnb proposition. What we do have, and I know Minister spoke to it earlier in his presentation, was the projects that we know are happening. And this just gives an idea of how Georgetown will transform, and of course, Bodentown, and then also there's a new resort that is proposed for the Eastern District's um, Barefoot Beach Resort. So when you look at Seven Mile Beach, it's at capacity, and we have no choice but to go beyond Seven Mile Beach and look at areas to develop tourism. Airbnb. I want to talk a little bit about how do we pair the Airbnb discussion with Caymanian entrepreneurship, with living like a local and sharing the Cayman Islands local experience, with the rooms and the tours and the activities. So when you think about the Cayman Islands, we have a lot to offer. And big businesses like Sea Fire, the Ritz Carlton, they have their partnerships that are established. But what about the person who has maybe five Airbnb properties, who's in the Eastern Districts, who wants activities for their guests? So now we're looking at how do we pair small businesses together? How do we pair a riding tour company with a food provider or caterer and have that be within the confines of their community, their district? How, we, how do we bring local experiences rather than having just someone stay at the, an Airbnb and then having to drive or find transportation elsewhere. This is a major opportunity for small and medium businesses to band together to provide Cayman Islands experiences. With Airbnb, they have a specific category for this. 
It's called Airbnb Experiences. There are activities designed and led by inspiring locals, so ambassadors for the destination. They go beyond typical tours or classes by immersing guests in the host's unique world. So you're gonna live and experience what a local would typically do. It's not a system, it's not a big tour, you don't have audio, lead, whatever. It's that person telling you what they like to do in their Caymanian way and what they feel represents the destination best. So this would be, they, they term it as earn money leading people of activities you love. So giving the power to the local ambassadors to say, I like going to this fishing spot, let me take you with you. And then you monetize that, well I just gave you an experience, so here's, here's what it is for my tour. I don't have to leave my district, I take advantage of taking a visitor someplace that you wouldn't typically go, and I'm having an authentic experience. So within DOT, we're hosting a summit to do a scan of how can we really bring small and medium businesses together to be able to have a strong representation on Airbnb experiences. Airbnb started in the Cayman Islands as a bad word. And then we regulated it, and then we fostered a relationship. We have an agreement. And now we're looking at marketing opportunities. So for the first time in our media plan, we actually have bought into uh, Airbnb advertising, which is why this summit of bringing small and medium businesses together is so important, because we have to have an offer. We have to represent the destination. Uh, so that'll take place August through uh, I wouldn't say December of this year. Um, so we've come full circle with a disruptor. First, nobody understood what Airbnb was. They thought it was a threat. We've created a tool, a tool to one, create jobs, entrepreneurship, and now enhance the cultural experience for the Cayman Islands. So Airbnb is a strategic partner that we very much enjoy working with. Saying all that, what does that mean in bringing it back to this economic forums platform in that what's the value of tourism? We don't have a formal mechanism outside of tourism revenue to, to measure the overall tourism impact. Yes, we get sentiment by how many persons work in tourism. We get a sentiment of imports and construction and that type of thing but we don't have a true tourism impact number. And our goal is to look at business solutions that will give us a better understanding of our growth and our overall impact for the destination. And then moving into a lifestyle brand, because I realize time is upon us, I want to talk a little bit about coming from the video that we first started with and looking at all of the natural beauty that the Cayman Islands has to offer. In 2017, the Caribbean experienced two very, very destructive hurricanes. And Cayman was very fortunate, yes, but our region suffered a lot of negative PR. And we felt that if we continued to market the Cayman Islands in the same way, we would get the exact same result. Uh, so we had to challenge ourselves to say, okay, what is it about Cayman? Because we have gone through a number of transformations. Our product has changed significantly in a very short period of time. We know we want to flatten seasonality. We know that we're a lifestyle brand because all of our research that we get says that people come here because it's special. They feel safe. There's quality in our culinary. There's quality in the product. And that's why we have a very high repeat rate. It resonates with our target audience. But how do you communicate a lifestyle brand in a way that ev evokes or attracts a new audience? It's great to have high repeat, but what we're looking for is new business. And I'll just get to, we were told we're the Maui of the Caribbean. Now I've never been to Maui, but for some partners, they believe that that's premium. Premium in terms of the American traveler and what they see as the ultimate experience in terms of Hawaii and an island destination that's accessible to most. And we looked at, okay, look at the pricing, look at the access, 
where is Cayman compared to our competitors? And if we go back to that map that I showed earlier, there's a few destinations that are considered super luxury, BVI, Turks and Caicos, and then there's some specific properties within destinations, Sandy Lane and Barbados. Um, Anguilla is very, very small, but seen as super luxury. So we wanted to leverage what is it that we offer that nobody else offers. And for us, it is our stunning natural beauty, but also the lifestyle that can be fashionable, that can be trendy. And that's what we wanted to capture in our new destination campaign. Somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me. My lover stands on golden sands and watches the ships that go sailing. We started with that, I want to say it was the Grammys or the Emmys, in the demographic area of Denver when, when we wanted to announce Cayman Airways service. So you may not see Cayman Islands television ads because we've moved to specific demographic areas within our markets. But this allowed us to convey the natural beauty and also a different natural beauty. Did you see Beyond Seven Mile Beach? That was shot over Cayman Brack on the bluff. A lot of our visitors question the pristine white beach. They want to see maybe just a little bit of sargasm, not a lot. But they want to know that it's real. They want to know that it's authentic. And don't quote me by saying that, please, because I know sargasm is a real issue. And my presentation, let's see. Here we go. We have one more video. Somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me. So again, We've always wanted a moonlight shot. We have all sorts of sunshine and sunsets. This shows Cayman in a more romantic way. Somewhere and of course you have to have underwater. Beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me. So I will leave it there to say that Dreaming Cayman is supposed to be disruptive. It's supposed to captivate the audience that has all eyes on who's left and who's not offline. And we took our opportunity to do something extremely different in the marketplace to grab attention. For the first time, we were on page two and three of Departures Magazine. We have gotten great placement. Uh, within our magazines, and I probably got the magazine wrong, but we've been in Afar, we've been in Travel and Leisure, we've been in Departures, and you've seen mermaids, and you've seen dragons, bale of turtles, and underwater orchids, and mermaids with fish dresses. and crystal caves not on the beach and underwater ballerinas. I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to share a little bit of tourism with you today. Well, thank you, Rosa. I'd like to keep you up on the stage, if you could, and uh, if the minister for tourism, the Honorable Moses Kukernel could join you. I have, even before your presentation finished, people have been giving me questions, so there's, there's quite a few questions. Some of them are connected, some aren't, so I'll, I'll just go through some of the easements. First off, um, if I could have you um, take the microphone, and I just thought, you know, obviously out of courtesy, um, Rosie, you had the top billing, but we have the minister with us. So I didn't know if the minister wanted to say something to the audience uh, about uh, the strategy that um, the ministry is undertaking. Um, and you know, certainly May, May record-breaking record month of May, that's, that's outstanding. So minister, if you wanted to say a few words. 
Well, thank you very much, Will. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think you owe Rosa another round of applause because it was a fabulous presentation. And Rosa and her team do a fantastic job. When you look at the numbers that we're driving um, to the Cayman Islands, it's very, very positive. We're very excited about not only this year, but the years to come with the stakeholders that we have, um, the bricks and mortar that's coming out, 20% growth in the next two years. We believe that we're in a very good place for tourism. So I'm sure I'll get some questions today, um, but Rosa will be more than happy to take most of them. Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll launch right into the questions. So the first question deals with um, how will we develop new tourism initiatives to handle the new thousands of people who are coming due to cruise and stay over tourism. Um, can, we, can we only handle so much on Seven Mile Beach in Stingray City? Thank you very much for the question. I believe that the opportunity for more arrivals, and it's identified as cruise, but we can say cruise and stay over, is to look at the Cayman Islands as a whole. What has happened now is Seven Mile Beach has developed first. We have been um, pushing a Go East initiative uh, in the last couple of years especially. And if you look at the opportunities that are available for all three islands through the growth, that's the responsibility of, of government to make sure that everybody benefits from the growth. Um, Rosa spoke about Airbnb. We spent a lot of time in different districts when we were doing a tourism plan. And, and every district that we were in wants more tourism. Every district that we were in had ideas of what kind of tourism they wanted. So I believe that there's a tremendous potential. I believe that every year we have a lot of graduates coming out of high school and we've got to get them involved in tourism. And the secret for our tourism product is the Caymanian people themselves. So the next question deals with our taxi industry and ride share. And some, some say in the audience that there are some very easy fixes that are just not being addressed. They didn't tell us what those fixes were. But uh, so why, why they say is the industry taking so long to address some of the issues that they face? Thank you for the question. As a chairperson for public transport, I guess you got ready for me. Um, we have taken the last 18 months to look at the entire public sector, sorry, public transport sector. Uh, we first started with the availability of taxis. So for those going out at night, uh, wanting a late restaurant, um, you know, journey, uh, wanting to come from the club, there was an unavailability issue of taxis. So we started granting and opening up the category. Then we dealt with complaints. We, have beha we had behavioral issues uh, and that impacted the visitor experience. And we did a number of surveys, customer service surveys, to identify the training that was needed and also got a lot more um, disciplined with holding uh, taxi operators, omnibuses, and the like accountable for their actions. So if we received a complaint, the board acted upon it. Then we decided, okay, we need an overall plan. So I would have made updates through the media that the board has been working on a five-year strategic plan. We've consulted with the Ministry of Planning and we are aware of their intent for a better um, public transport system. But for the categories that currently exist with Omni and Taxi, there needed to be a formulation of what are the priorities for public transport. Regarding the ride share, there are two companies that currently have um, trade and business license or have an intent to operate. And the government supports taxi apps and being able to do ride share once they use the approved taxi operators from the public transport board through that legislation and function. We have business solutions that we're working on, and the reason why I'm being general is, it, is that it's mm -hmm. dependent on legislation that's currently being drafted. So I'm unable to say what the government's 
specific solution is until we have the legislation that governs it. And it also addresses taxi fares. And being able to have the public know what a taxi fare is before they get into a taxi. So if you can take the reassurance that the board has heard the public outcry for inconsistency in taxi fares, but we've also heard from the taxis to say we haven't had a raise since 2008. We're trying to balance both concerns of the public. One, being quoted the correct taxi fare as published through the taxi scheme, and also for taxis to feel as if their earning power is growing with the cost of living because it has been static since 2008. Thanks. I yeah. hope I've covered the question. Ashi? Okay, um, shouldn't we allow Uber, Uber is the next question. I think you kind of referred to that in your response, so you're still I think still we should have it? a Caymanian Uber, which is either cabby or flex. I would prefer for the money to stay in the Cayman Islands and for it to be a Caymanian owned business, and I hope I'm not misspeaking, Minister, but that's why I said that we support the taxi apps that are proposed the legislation will also propel those two companies by giving them the framework of a new taxi fare scheme and we'll work with them as well. So we have met with both entities on various occasions. So as you can imagine, there's several questions about the cruise dock, so I'm going to dive right in. To our pardon the pun. Um, what is the timeline that government would be able to announce the final bidder for the port? What's the timeline, Minister? Three weeks. Okay. And then the other one is, should the cruise dock become a reality, do you think overnight cruises will become a reality? You mean cruise ships staying cruise overnight? Ships, yes, cruise ships staying overnight. I don't think so. And what's your view on increasing the population to 100,000 people and by when? What does that have to do with the cruise dock? I'm just, these are questions, sir. <laughs> uh, um, I think that we all need to be realistic and understand that this country has to grow. And, and when you look at a carrying capacity, the carrying capacity shouldn't be thrown on top of us in a short period of time. It should be looked at, do we want to grow 2% a year, 3% a year, 4% a year, 5% a year? What opportunities does that give? How do we employ the young people that are coming out? How do we attract the, the type of um, professionals that we need here. Um, in, in my view, rather than give, I think there's a method for us to put in place of how we get to the 100,000 that, number one, secures each of the Caymanians future and makes it, the, they continue to make it the place it is now to live and to work. And it's incumbent upon us to, to start on that journey to make sure we know where we're going. So the, this may be for directly to Rosa, because you may have the statistics, but they want to know what, what is our repeat visitor rate and how do we compare, say, to other destinations in the region? I'll lean on my team for the comparison, but our repeat rate is upwards of 50%. Cassandra, are you in the audience? Can you take? 46%, she 46. says. I like to round things up. That's Thank you. <laughs> Upward. That's a good. That's a good sign of a good tourism director. So, um, will will? But that's a really important question because it's a differentiator between us and other destinations. When you have um, prof travel professionals that work extremely hard to place people in different countries, and you have a repeat guess of 10, 20 percent, it's it's not productive and it's not the destination of choice when this travel professional sends somebody and they don't want to come back. So why they like the Cayman Islands and why our repeat guests is, are one of the highest in the region is because we deliver on what the promise is. In fact, I think we over deliver. So when people visit what they have thought and what they have purchased and what they believe they're going to get is what they get and more. And that's why the, the guests continue to come back. And we'll deal with a question on, on the BRAC. Um, are there any new hotel developments or uh, signs of any um, investment that you're aware of, Minister, that can increase the BRAC's tourism capacity? 
Um, absolutely. The arrivals on BRAC were up 20% for the last two years from the airlift. The Dark Corporation bought La Salle Dior, and they're in the process now of, of reopening it um, under their, one of their brands, and they've just advertised for more workers. The Tibbetts family is looking at expanding the Brack Reef Beach Resort, and they've got the, the plans done for the rooms they're going to add. Um, there's another major group that's looking for the properties already purchased. The plans haven't been turned in, but they're right in the, in the stage of starting to prepare their plans, and that's on the east side of Cayman Brack on the bluff, so it'd be a very exciting project. Um, and the Airbnb numbers continue to grow. So we're, we're pleased with the, the um, growth of the BRAC right now. Next question deals with marketing and branding. And uh, it says, uh, we are aimed at a target market, which is quality versus quantity. It says, why are we spending so much on cruise tourism and not investing even more in the stayover product? Really good question. Um, I'd like to take you back six years uh, when I got the ministry. What we had then was an airport that was over um, subscribed with the number of people coming through. We had a period of about 15 years that people had talked about doing a new airport and we were, had about 280,000 arrivals for the year. We had 1.3 million arrivals for cruise in that year and the economy itself was creeping along and wondering what we, could we do. So we want both. We want stayover and we want cruise. Stayover, the average spend is around $1,500 average, and if that's for seven days, and the average spend on a cruise is $100 a day. So seven days, that's $700. So a cruise visitor spends half. So both of these can be drivers for our economy. We need to understand how we make it easier and how we get more out of each one of them and how we strike the balance that we need. If you go down to the cruise port in the morning, you will see over 300 taxi drivers that every one of those are Caymanian and their families depend on the livelihood that they're making. I personally believe that we need to make sure that each one of them know there's a good future there and know that it's gonna continue and know there's a growth potential. That's the balance that we have to strike with our cruise product. Now, if you ask me, am I pleased with how the cruise mix goes right now because they only spend $100 a day, I'll tell you I'm not. St. Martin has a spend of $185 a day. That's where Cayman should be. But we have to do certain things for the infrastructure to make that happen. In the same way that when we looked at the airport, we had great plans, but we didn't have any money. So we had to build an airport with no money. So we took the passenger fee and we leveraged cash flow and we built $60 million airport that is now going to be expanded and lengthen the runway and the jetways put in. So that is moving forward in a very good way and we see that this year we hope to top 500,000 stayover visitors and friends and family are able to enjoy the airport. So I, I think we have to be realistic. We need both for our economy. We're tapping around 30% of the economy. And, and we need to understand that you can't grow this product if you don't invest in the infrastructure for it. So the last two questions, because we have to go to the coffee break. We're five minutes over. Okay? Don't blame me. <laughs> yes, it was me. <laughs> Just teasing. Um, so basically, we didn't re really see anything about medical tourism in your strategy. So is there a strategy for medical tourism and how significant is that going to be for you? So we've had this internal discussion, we like to call it destination health care, because when you say medical tourism, it doesn't really translate to the same thing when you're engaging um, with providers to discuss you know, what's happening in the destination. When we talk to airlines, they very much get it. They understand having facilities that offer first class services will drive traffic on the on the airplanes into the into the Cayman Islands where we would like to focus is best in class so there are clinics that exist here i use the stem cell clinic for example that kind of flew under the radar for a long time until we started to do our research obviously there's health city we have um, 
first class care in Cayman Brac, that's always a question when it comes to an island experience. Well, what type of health care do you have? Will we be able to get the best care should something happen to us? And that discussion comes up with group travel when you have a lot of persons coming into the destination as a part of a company all at one time. Uh, we have a portion of our website that provides information. It's the linkage between the fact that our research tells us that almost 92% of our visitation come for recreational activity and leisure and making the bridge to how do we support the medical tourism, furthering the growth and also the expansion of the Cayman Islands and the capability. So it's about the capability of the services offered and where it's offered. So that's an ongoing discussion as to how do we envelope it into what is mainly a travel strategy within the Department of Tourism. Thank you. The final question is probably maybe the most controversial. It's about obviously the people and the referendum that they're trying to call, have government uh, sanction for them. The question comes down to, um, will the government listen to that? And what is, what is the government's view on, the, on that referendum? Or will the government continue with its own plan, which will be to ultimately go through the process of selecting a bidder and proceeding forward with your strategy? Very good question. The government obviously is bound by the Constitution. The Constitution gives the right for people initiated referendum, which is the process that's being gone through now. When the, the part of the process that's happening now is um, certifying the signatures, when that is completed, if it is that there are enough signatures for a referendum. It then goes to cabinet and at that point cabinet will take the decision based on where we are. We have a, a law we'll have to pass in the LA for it. We'll have to um, consider that, debate that, and then we also have the issues of the referendum sitting there. So I think that's one part of it. The other part of it is that you can't run a country by referendum. If, if everything we're going to have to take a decision on has to be a referendum, we won't get a whole lot done. So at this point, we have a, a green light. We've spent $9 million um, with PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, um, the best uh, companies in class to give us the information when it was first said that if there was going to be an issue with Seven Mile Beach, when the environmental assessment came back, the Beard Group re world recognized said there would be no issue. We said if there had been, we were going to stop. We went forward. Um, the, the process itself demands that there's no government signature uh, guaranteeing the funds. It means that there will be a loan, and that loan will be paid back by the people who have the license, the winning bidder, and once that license expires, the dock will be owned by the country and the people of the Cayman Islands. And there's a process to be followed, it's, it's spelt out, and I believe that is the, the position we find ourselves in today. So we will continue with what we have been doing for the last six years, and when the time comes that the referendum numbers have been certified, It'll follow the process, and we'll move from there. So it's a design, build, and maintain contract, ultimately. They borrow the money. It's on them to pay it back. And then the government will receive well, some of the proceeds from the crew's tendering or not, will be helped to pay them so that they can finance the loan that they borrowed. Design, build, build finance, finance, and maintain. And maintain. The question that we've had over and over is how much is the dock going to cost? I don't know, because we're waiting for the bid to come in, design, bill, finance, maintain. The question we've had is what is the design? I don't know, because we're waiting for the winning bidder, the preferred bidder, to show us. We'll be very happy and very proud to, to take that to the country and let everybody see what has been done and see what the offering is. Now, 
there, there is limits to what we are in favor of doing. If this has any way to compromise the stability of this country, it will not go forward. If we've heard rumors um, that it would cost $400 million. Well, I can assure you, if something like that was to come back, it will not have my support to go forward. What we were told by the consultants is we were looking around $180 million, and then we put the cargo in there, and we believe from, again, what people who are best in class have said, you know, we're 200, uh, and the 200, 205, 210, somewhere around there. Um, I, hope that's what it, I hope that's what it comes back at, but I don't know what it's going to come back at because procurement has been dealing with this. This is not for the policymakers. We haven't been involved. There's, again, a structure of the major project um, office of how they do things and how procurement looks at it. I hope that helps. Thank you, Minister. And, and you really should give the Minister, he's, he's battling a cold. So thank you for even arriving. Thank you for asking, accepting our questions. And thank you, Rosa, for an excellent presentation. We now have a coffee break, so I'd ask everyone if you could reconvene here at 3.15. Thank you.